Hi everybody. For the past week I've been attending the International Conference for Snow Leopard Conservation in Xinjiang, China. And at the conference it's been a whole bunch of researchers from governments and NGOs from around the world getting together to discuss uh, conservation about this important species. Now a number of different groups here have been doing occupancy modelling, or at least surveys for occupancy to try and establish you know, whereabouts snow leopards are uh, within their sort of uh, known range. And a number of different groups, what they've been doing is defining the size of their, their sampling unit or their grid cell size at the scale of a home range for a snow leopard. And they're huge. Uh, they're in the order of you know, a couple of hundred square kilometres. And it's something that's quite often done with occupancy modelling when people are working in these contiguous areas. And they quite often will define a, a cell size, if they're working with a grid, at the scale of a, an approximate home range size. Now this is something that's been done for lots of different texts, so it's not just for, for snow leopards or, or other big cats. And it's something, again, that's quite commonly done. But it's something that uh, isn't strictly necessary. It is certainly a way of defining a, a grid cell, if, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but the issue is, you know, the animals don't know where the lines on the map are. So you could quite easily have one individual spanning multiple grid cells. And you can also have parts of these very large grid cells that may uh, actually have the species being absent from them. So it's a fairly coarse type measure when you're trying to measure occupancy in terms of how many square uh, areas, uh, sorry, how many square kilometres of area uh, might be uh, occupied by the species. So my suggestion is that you don't need to do that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with defining the, the size of a grid cell at something smaller than a home range. And in actual fact, I often suggest and recommend that people do something smaller uh, than the home range because the idea is that you're trying to avoid that situation where you may have the species actually only present in, say, half of a very large unit. There's also the issue that when you have these very large units that you may not be able to effectively sample that whole thing or a very good fraction of it. And so, again, you may... Uh, effectively only be sampling a small portion of that grid cell, so therefore extrapolating that out to a very large area you know, may be a fairly large assumption. So my recommendation to, to lots of people is that you don't need to be um, sampling or defining grid cells at that scale, and in actual fact something a lot smaller is, is often pretty good. Because you have to remember that occupancy is a species level um, measure, Okay, so whether you have a, an area that's occupied by single or multiple individuals is kind of irrelevant, as is if you have the same individual in multiple grid cells. Now there are some practical considerations in terms of how you do the sampling to ensure uh, things like independence, uh, <clears throat> but that's just a special case of spatial correlation, and we know exactly how to deal with spatial correlation uh, if we need to, uh, or we can deal with it in terms of our sampling design is another good way of dealing with sampling correlation. And a few months back I, I did another video on spatial correlation which you may want to review. So that's it, so that's my tip from, from Xinjiang here in China. Um, occupancy, uh, when you're doing occupancy studies, the size of your grid cell doesn't have to be at, at approximately the size of a home range for an individual. Uh, it can be something much smaller than that, and I often recommend that it should be. So there you have it, I uh, hope you found that useful, and until next time, have a good one. See ya.